Galatians chapter 5. Study number 11 still. I have uh, some copies here, I think. Study 11. I have lost it. Last week we began looking at the list of 17 works of the flesh uh, at the end there. Uh, in verse number 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresy, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But through the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. All right, last week we got through, I think, about the first four of those. We uh, kind of did a brief, in-depth look at adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness, and we kind of touched on idolatry for a few minutes there, uh, but to pick up with idolatry, uh, what are some things today that we see uh, in idolatry? I think last time we, last week we discussed how idolatry is not, in, in our time, it's not something that we might not see a whole lot in our little bubble. But idolatry is still something that's practiced around the world. Uh, we can see it in different various religions, uh, but we also look how idolatry does not necessarily apply to just simply religion. How does idolatry also affect us today in our world? Positions. Yeah. No. Anything that we have that we put before God can become an idol to us. We place it in importance and a priority in our life, and a priority takes place of God and what God desires of us, that idolatry, that that is in itself an idol. All right, uh, any comments or questions on those ones that we looked at um, in the in last week, anything that came to mind in, in uh, this week? Anything manifest to you that means plain, made known? All right, so let's pick back up here. So what about witchcraft? Uh, what is witchcraft? Witchcraft is sorcery, isn't it? Sorcery? What things do we see today uh, that would indicate sorcery for us, that might be a problem for us? Last week we did. Did I tell you how good y'all did last week? <laughs> y'all did great last week in your discussion. <clears throat> sorcery. There is some real sorcery or witchcraft going on in the world today, even in the United States. I saw an article the other day. That's what Facebook was on the news again. Some woman, I think she's out in California, that sold all her books and getting it up. Yeah. Yeah, people people still practice witchcraft. I mean, it's it's a small little thing uh, in comparison to what it once was, but 
people still believe in satanic practices? Is still uh, is the is it the Ouija board? Do people still do that today? I know kids sometimes think they they can conjure up spirits and those things. Uh, it still has a cult following in uh, the Hollywood era. They still make movies about witchcraft. Uh, they still I know when I was growing up the the Harry Potter books were coming out, and I had friends as parents wouldn't let them read or go watch those movies because of the, the witchcraft that they believed it taught. Now, they, that might be an extreme opinion by some. They, they, they teach, uh, needs to determine that for themselves, but uh, witchcraft is something here. Uh, what I was reading last week is that witchcraft, uh, there was such an appeal for witchcraft in this time to the Galatians and the pagan worshippers because of one big thing. Uh, what do you think the sorcerers or the witches use a lot of that would entice people to follow after them? Drugs. drugs. Yeah, drugs were are uh, hallucinants. You know, they would use certain uh, things, certain plants, and other things that would cause the people that follow them to hallucinate or have these visions or see things. Uh, in a wild way that it would entice them to come back. I mean, because they're in high. Um, do we not kind of see that today in drug use? Spiritual things that are what they classify as spiritual events in their life because of drug use? Absolutely. Uh, that is a form, that can be a form of witchcraft. They had a, an outer body experience. I think uh, most of the Beatles <laughs> believe they had outer body experiences when they were on LSD. So that's uh, something that, that we still see today. Who do we know about the Bible that was uh, practicing witchcraft? The witch of Endor? Simon the Sorcerer, right? Uh, there, are, there are people that practice those things. Uh, we see that Simon the Sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, he was converted to Christianity, uh, and he gave that up. Uh, we, if we're not careful, can get caught up in certain things that um, are fringe ideas in, in our world uh, that people uh, want to go down, and it can cause us to lose our focus on Christ. Uh, I went into uh, Dollar General yesterday. I happened to go, when I went in, there was a magazine rack right there as you go in the door. Right there on the front cover, it was a major magazine. I don't know if it was Time or New Week or whatever. Right across the top was Witches. And that's what the uh, magazine was about. So evidently there's uh, some interest in it or study of it or people are curious about it. You know, the, the major publication would be I think there's still conventions, like they hold big national conventions, kind of like uh, the comic book convention. They still have conventions for uh, people that practice or believe in those witchcraft ideas. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know how big we're following, but they do have those uh, around the country. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, you can wave the little cursor like, around your head. Like, <laughs> I, I need my what is it, aura. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it is true. I mean, uh, today anything can be marketed to us, and I think that in itself is a form of witchcraft. Uh, you, you can solve your problems with like a sword. Uh, it, it, it goes hand, it kind of goes hand in hand with idolatry. It's, it's a form of, of religion, it's a form of God that they're trying to. Uh, that is a false god. Uh, you can receive your power through things that are mystical. Well, God has all power, and he does not allow that uh, to take away from his glory uh, and his power. Anything else on that? Can you spark the interest in children because of the fairy tales and all the stories? Yeah, I, I never read the books. I was too busy playing the cafeteria for Pop. Uh, 
get to read them to us after lunch for 30 minutes. So I missed all the books, but I always had to go to the butcher and watch the movie. Uh, but but I do remember kids that wouldn't say they would read their own book in math because of, that's what their parents were doing, were instructing them to do. Which kudos to the parents for you know being involved and and actually the kids listening to them in that matter. I think that needs to be done more so today. Uh, for parents at home and instruct their kids on how, what, how they're to act in class and uh, what they need to be right for them in terms of their uh, spiritualness. But, you know, you think about it, I mentioned last week how many times we can look throughout history how things have been done in the name of religion that have been totally evil. Uh, so that same is true for witchcraft. Things have been totally done, atrocities have been done in, in the name of witchcraft as well. Um, think about the people, this was big uh, in the in the 90s, uh, mediums, right? They could talk to the dead. And they'd have these, I remember TV shows, those, uh, I guess you would classify them as talk shows or whatever, where the host would pick somebody up in the audience and, you know, I'm, I'm sensing, I'm seeing the letter M. I'm seeing the letter M. Pretty, like, uh, my mom's name was Mary. I'm like, oh, yeah, it, it is Mary. She's, she's calling to me, right? And if people would get caught up in this and they would be giving all their money to these mediums, uh, these people that supposedly could speak to the dead. Well, um, they're all frauds. They're all in it for money. Uh, right here, I've got a note that says that uh, Art Baker on a TV program in 1951, so a long, long time ago, had a spiritualist expose of the work of mediums and announced that Americans at that time had paid 125000 annually for this deceit. Well, 125000 a year is not a whole lot of money in today's terms. But in 1951, people were sending money to these mediums to, because they believed that they could talk to the dead. You know, that spiritualism was, was, a, was a big practice, especially up in New York. Um, I remember in college, I had to do a study. Uh, we were talking about, it was a, it was a uh, history of religion in America. We would look at different religions, and one of the things that, that I was called to study on was spiritualism. And in, upstate, in the New York area, these spiritualists were, would have seances. They would come together and they would, you know, put a candle in the center of the table and they'd hold hands and they would chant and do all these things to try to call on the spirits of their loved ones to come and speak to them. Uh, that was a way in which people would, you know, the person that was the leader that would be getting paid to come and hold those seances. Uh, so witchcraft is still was, is still practiced today. Uh, might not entice you, but it is something that we have to address if need be uh, in this. Uh, the practice of sorcery was extensive in many places that Paul visited. If you look at Acts 19, 19, uh, and then 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9, we can see uh, that. And we also, we've already mentioned that Simon the Sorcerer in Acts 8, 9, and 10, uh, was, he was plagued by that or a part of that uh, before becoming a Christian. Uh, or Francis, a magician. Mm -hmm. And you've got a seance. It's, it's a thing. And you've got a chair that people sit in. And you've got a button in his foot. Shoot him. Hit him. And he pops up with a magic on the Really? Yeah. And that's, that's ultimately what it is. It's all him. It's all him. I'm sure everybody's like, oh, that happened, you know, he, he, he got them. Uh, put line and sinker on that one. So, yeah, that could definitely be. <laughs> That's funny to think about. All right, uh, let's look at our next one here if we don't have any more comments. What about hatred? What does the word hatred mean? Enmity. A division between two parties, is it, what, what would be involved in hatred? Disgust, yeah, disgust, yeah. You know, it, it could just be, a, it could be from a difference of issues that, that you have, two viewpoints that are at odds and you're going to butt heads about. Um, often in the area of judgment and over personalities is where you find hatred, and it sometimes makes enemies among the brethren. I think about Hatred in, in the 
church, you know, where does the discord and the dislike for brethren oftentimes come? Is it over an issue in God's word? Nine times out of ten, if there is hatred among brethren in the church, what is it? Personalities, isn't it? It's a, it's a disagreement on a personal matter. Uh, and sometimes it can be covered by a spiritual issue, but is the spiritual issue usually the problem? No, it's usually something that uh, people have that you didn't talk to me when I was walking out the back door. I've heard a preacher talk about that before where a, a member cut, a person came in and said, I'm not coming back to y'all ever talk to me. And the preacher said, well, how many people have you talked to today? You know, that's, that's people get easily offended and it causes uh, strife and, and hatred among uh, the brothers and sisters. Um, what did, uh, what's the opposite of, of what we have here? It says, what Jesus said would enable the world to know that we are his disciples. What does John 13, 35 say? John 13, 35. Somebody look at 1 Peter 2 and verse 17. And then 1 John 2, 7 through 11. So we are identified as disciples of Christ through our love, and that includes our love for one another, right? What about John, or I'm sorry, 1 Peter 2, 17? 1 Peter 2, 17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Okay, so Peter, what is his instructions? The church, yeah, it's the church. We are commanded to love the brotherhood uh, in our walk. And then, what is the what does First John two seven through eleven say? Stirs up 
first try, but he knew it was slow to anger. Quits attention. Okay. Now we have a hot head described there. And then what is the, the uh, antidote to a hot head? What was that antidote given at the end of that first run? Slow to anger. Slow to anger. Self control. All right, and then 2825. Okay, trust the Lord uh, and take away our strife. You know, strife can come from a variety of different sources, can it? You know, it could be a personal issue, it can be a uh, pet peeve. You know, things that just get under our skin that we, we allow it to uh, fester. Um, but strife is a, is a problem that can affect the church. If you go back to the verses, verses of you, verses before in Galatians 5, uh, what does he say or warn against and that could destroy the church? He illustrates it as bite and devour, right? Bite and devour. We will eat ourselves up if we allow hatred and strife to enter in. Now consider some other, other sources there. Genesis 13 uh, and verse 7. What is the source of strife that we see in Genesis 13 and verse 7? And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle, the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. What was the strife? Yeah, you had you had Abraham and Lot. What about Luke 22 and verse 24? What does it say in Luke 22 and verse 24? There was also a strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? That was strife among who? And they're where they want to be in terms of uh, how their prestige was identified among the disciples, among the apostles. Uh, so strife can, can come in various ways and from various sources. Uh, just some other verses here if you want to jot those down and look at. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 3, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 4, and 2 Timothy 2 and verse 23. Uh, variance is often seen in church troubles when men take opposite sides, not so much from different convictions or or from personal or as from personal dislike, the desire to hinder a cause, an opponent trouble. Um, uh, this is probably a major reason for the current situation in a lot of churches. You think about churches that split. It's because of strife. It's not over doctrinal matters a lot of times. Now, sometimes it is, but as I said earlier, uh, those doctrinal matters are just a facade for personal issues that we have. Um, you know, we think about the segregation of teachers because of strife. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3 talks about that. Um, you know, a lot of preachers won't have anything to do with other preachers because of. Uh, envying and, and jealousy because of the different things that have gone on in their past. All right, any comments or questions over that one? Yeah, patience has a lot to do with it as well. Like in my own personal life, the things that my wife does sometimes <laughs> uh, uh, frustrates me, you know, and so rather than just, you know, not just talking freely, it's just not. not it's, <laughs> it's not something that is really of a importance. Yeah. Jed and I have to make a comment about it. And so, you know, rather than just, you know, loving her and accepting that yeah. it's the way she is that, you know, and it causes strife because of my lack of self-control and patience which doesn't do something that she needs to do. You know, I you all times think about it, but the, the petty things that just really get under our skin, isn't it? Things that, you know, are big deals and it's I, I can say it happens to me too. It's like that just really really irritates me and it's nothing major but we, we allow it to enter into our hearts and we let it build and then it's, it's like 
shaking up a two liter that's that's full, right? That top, you take a top of it, it's going to explode. Uh, that's not how we're going to handle things. Uh, we have to have a, a spirit of meekness and kindness and love uh, in those situations. My personal experience with me is the most difficult is in that, you know, I used to be pretty patient and caring, I think, and then uh, basically had a war with my father. And I felt like I won because of my hate, you know, and he went into wrath. And it converts itself into something feeling like it's okay if, you know, the person sins. And then, and then, you know, you can even convert it further on down the line. And it's easier and easier to be a hate or to uh, feel like you're right. And so then everybody becomes wrong at some point. And then I'm the only one that's right. So, yeah. um, I think it's, really dangerous because it, it doesn't, like witchcraft, you know, nobody would say, or a lot of people wouldn't say, hey, that's okay, but um, if you really think about, or if I really think about my own, you know, how I built my hate into a weapon, it felt like uh, almost, um, it felt almost peaceful, like, okay, I've won all these battles, so. Personally, I feel like I want to do that, which I do. So I think it's, it really uh, feels like a regret thing. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's, that's a, a very good point. You know, it, it sounds, and I, we all are guilty of this, we justify our minds. You know, when it comes to those those battles that we have, we justify, well, I act this way because of that person, therefore I am right. And you're right, you know, over time it, it's, it counsels us, you know, it replaces the love that we have with hate, and it just, like you're saying, it becomes easier and easier, uh, and that, that is a danger, you know, it, it could start with something small, you know, very, very small, and then ultimately, like you're saying, it's, over time, it's, it's every better, I, I would rather be right uh, than and I'd rather lose. I would rather lose a, or win every fight than, than appear to be wrong. Uh, so it's it's a it is a challenge. I think it's a great point. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? Well, let's uh let's go into emulations. Uh, the word for emulations is another word that we use. It's called common in our is jealousy. Uh, the jealousies that we have. Um, this is the meaning from this is through ambitious or envious rivalry. You know, we all remember that one person we grew up with that we were friends with. That it was a, a, a rivalry that we had with one another. Uh, this takes it a little further. Uh, this leads to the idea of resentment. You know, I resent that person because of X, Y, Z. Because they they accomplished this, or because they did this, because they have that. Now, this seems like a major uh, scourge on our world around us today, doesn't it? Everybody is upset about what others have. You know, we can see it, and not, I'm trying to, I believe I'm not trying to get political, but we can see it in our culture today that, you know, people are upset because of the, our past history. You know, I, I am a person of privilege. Jealousy because of privilege. Well, I don't, I don't know if that's an accurate statement, uh, but we allow jealousy to come in and we resent others. Uh, it says painful feelings, anxious fear, and unfounded suspicion are aroused in the heart over the excellencies of others. Unholy desire and strife to excel one another. Uh, emulation or jealousies will never allow one to rejoice with them and that rejoice. What passage is that? Romans, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. 12, 15, Romans 12, 15. Uh, instead, it makes people miserable. You know, when, when you have that feeling of resentment, are you hurting the other person? Oftentimes, it is doing what? It is eating yourself up, right? You are, you are, the 
just tearing yourself up on the inside. And the other person oftentimes doesn't even know. You know, but we do that to ourselves. We, we are, you know, how many times do we just spend so much time in our mind thinking about somebody else and they have no idea how much we are thinking about the things that they, they have. Uh, you know, uh, I think one person says, you know, it's, it's amazing how much time I, I can live rent free and another person can not uh, because they are so jealous of the things that, that we have that I've accomplished. Uh, that's how people oftentimes do. Uh, you know, you think about an example here. What did they say of Jesus uh, when, what was it Peter? When Andrew came to Peter and said, you know, I found the Messiah. What did, what did Peter say? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know, what kind of attitude is that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a perplexing thing to consider that, you know, Nazareth is nothing. Uh, but uh, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town. Uh, John stands an example of what we should be, and the attitude we should have toward the advancement and excellency of others. Look at John 3 and verse 33, if you will. What did John, John the Baptist say in regards to Christ? You know, John was a was had success preaching in the wilderness, had a following. But then Christ comes, and what does John say? He that had received his testimony has set to the seal of that God is true. Okay, that's the wrong passage. You said three. Three thirty. Oh, Did I say thirty three? He must increase but I must there you go. Thank you. He must increase, but I must decrease. You know, John, he, to the world standards, he could have every right to be jealous. You know, look at all that I have. Look at all that, that I saw. But John knew his place in history. He knew what his job was. He was the forerunner of Christ. And when Christ came and Christ was entering into his ministry, he said, I must decrease so Christ can increase. Media and all this stuff, they use it as a tool, political tool, to divide people up, you know, the one percent versus the ninety nine percent of the slave versus the slave owner and you know, women versus men or whatever. People get into a position where they have this problem in their lives because it is promoted and they feel like they've been cheated or mistreated or something in some form or fashion. How do, we, how do we handle that in ourselves? We may not have that problem in our lives as far as you know, that's not that sort of thing that these people do. You know, feel like they have been mistreated and are acting this way because of that. How do we react to it then? How, how, as a Christian, how do we deal with that? I think about, uh, what is it, Hebrews 13 5? No. Uh, what does it say in Hebrews 13 and 5? Let us be content with such things as we have. Yeah. I think that's the verse. If I'm right. That's the conversation we were talking about this last week. It's not the such thing as you have because we have to say that I'll never be a good person. Yeah, I think that's the verse that we can back that with. If we can focus on that verse, let us be content with such <coughs> things as we have. You know, you're right. You look at all the, the things that are around us. You can turn on the TV, you can get on your phone, you can get on your laptop, you know, I, I, I'm, this is not a boastful hour for me, I am so thankful that I don't have social media anymore, and I wish the world would get rid of social media, I really do, like, especially what I see in young people every single day, I mean, this is clearly, I think that it is glued to their hand, like it's, it's sewed into their hand now. And what are they, what are the kids in my school, I mean, constantly they are just taking selfies and watching TikToks and getting on Instagram and all they're doing is looking at ways in which they can be influenced by the world around them. You know, and I, I see it, I see kids that 
you know, they call them these people that call themselves influencers, you know, our young people, their their minds are being influenced and molded by these people on their phone, and they are jealous of what they have. They think of these people. What what do you see on social media? Do you see all the good or all the bad or a balance of both? You typically see people's good, right? They, they have, a lot of people, I know there are people that do share the bad things that happen in their life with these influencers. All you see are these great, wonderful things that their life is. And it's false. Like it's all, it's not real. And it's just encouraging these people, these young people, that this is the life that I want. This is, this, they become jealous of all the things that these people have on their phones or in their lives. And it's, it's false. It's just not a real perception of the world. And they want something different. They want something that is not, like I said, is not real. It's not grounded in faith. It's not grounded in, in the love of God. And that's the challenge that I see just in my profession with, with kids. So, any other comments on emulations or jealousies? Let's try to hit one more before we close here. Uh, the next one we have is wrath. Um, wrath, now, not a single person in here is, is a wrathful person, right? Uh, I know I've, I've had outbursts of anger, but that's what that is. Open eruption of an anger, uncontrolled anger. Uh, sometimes it's probably with physical harm in mind. I, I wanted to, you know, punch somebody's teeth out before I had it, thank goodness, but I wanted to. Uh, that's a, that is a, a dangerous thing in terms of our spiritualness. Uh, when we allow wrath to take place and we become powerless, it, uh, we can inflict injury. Often it vents itself in furious language and menacing gestures. You know, if you think about it, I remember uh, last basketball season we were playing a team and there was a parent of an opposing of the opposing team who was sitting in the top of bleachers, and we had it on camera, had, had it on photo, and we had to send it in to the other school's administration. She was flicking off using uh, bad gestures. She was shooting a bird, a double bird, to uh, our student section. So that is an example of wrath. It's classless. It's, it goes against anything that God wants us to do, but think about people and their outbursts of anger, uh, you know, the, the language that people use when they're angry, it's a commonplace now, isn't it? And in today's standards, it's, you know, you get angry, you just say what you want to. You just give it out. Uh, there's really no regard for what is right and honorable in our actions. What is class? Class? What is class? I guess you'll have to find that for you. It's a standard conduct for you know doing it morally right is how I would you know there is there's a right way to do it. And we use the term black black trash in a class or you know different things seem to be like the definition but the concepts behind it changed completely from what it was Eric and I were talking the other day somebody cut in front of us on the golf course and it turned from the through the yard across and just started playing, you know, they just cut us off. And the uh, Houston, there was etiquette in golf. It was a gentleman's game and that sort of thing, you know, you had certain standards, it's how you dressed, how you acted, how you treated, what you did on the course. And today, that, that doesn't have that, but I just use that, not in the sense that golf has anything to do with anything, but that's just a kind of a picture of how society is going to used to, there was manners and how they treat people and that sort of thing. That's what we call a class. Today it's, you know, it, you just run over people who don't even think about how they treat people anymore. And, uh, so, I mean, it's, it's a little different. Sometimes. Yeah, and, and I would agree. You know, it, it comes down to this. Uh, you know, how do we you use the word class? Well, righteousness. Moral of righteousness, living right, that's that's what righteousness means, living right. Well, the world today, should we expect them to know what righteousness is? 
not if they're not called. You know, if they're not being called. We as Christians, how can we expect the world to live righteously if we are not the example before them? You know, all of this list of things that, that we've covered thus far, you know, if wrath is on there, we're an angry person, we you know, we get angry easily, we that anger turns into speaking improperly, that anger turns into bad gestures or our behavior is wrong. Our moral uprightness is compromised and we want to expect the world to not do it as well. We have to have a standard of conduct and that standard is given to us through God's word. So you have the answer to this question I just want to ask. Uh, or the lack of manners or the not having that possessing uh, I'm not asking for answers. I know, I, I, I get what you're saying, like, you know, people are not conducting themselves, and, and it, I, it's it's dangerous to, to combine what our cultural norms are versus what God's standard for us is. You know, our cultural norms are different than what they might be in another country. Uh, you know, it, it's, uh, in our country, it's rude to slurp your soup. It is, but in some countries, it's a sign of, uh, it's, a, it's a gesture of, it's really good. It pays a compliment to the person that made her, the host. So we would say that's not a good manners. So we have to be careful in that regard, but our standard of conduct in terms of what the Bible says shouldn't change. You know, in every culture, there are social norms that are need to be followed doing what is right, being honest with people, uh, being a person of hard work and integrity. Uh, those are things that I think go beyond cultures and, and are set by God's standard. Anybody else as we close up here? to put people above ourselves. That's the means by which we show that is how we treat people. All right, thank you all for all your comments. And you started off slow, but you got back to where you were last week. So I'm proud of you. Yeah, you had to wake up. We'll pick up with... Uh, I think we're at strike again, which you had variance, and then you get to strike itself uh, in our next study. If you have any announcements that need to be made or updates, please let me know. I'll come and see you. Get down, got it down. Thank you.
make every effort to be here for that. And then Wednesday, we'll have our midweek Bible study at 7 p.m. That's all that I have at this time. If I need to make any changes, update any information, or add anything to our announcements, please see me after service. We'll sing 238, and then we'll have our scripture reading. 238. So I'll sing together. Holy, 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 Lord God of
I said in my heart, Go to now, and I will prove thee with mirth. Wherefore, <clears throat> therefore, enjoy pleasure, and behold, that also is vanity. And I said of laughter, It is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in my heart to give myself a wine, yet I clung in my heart wisdom that lay hold on folly, till I might see what was a good for the sons of man, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. And I made me great works, and I built me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruit. And I made me pools of water, to water there with the wood that transport the trees. And I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born into my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle, above all that were which were in the Jerusalem before me. I gathered together also silver and gold, and of cheaper treasure of kings, and of the provinces. And I gave me men singers and women singers, and the delights of men's sons of men, as musicians, as musical instruments. And that of all sorts. <coughs> so I was great. And I increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. And wherewith <coughs> withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all of my labor. And this is the portions of my labor. Then I looked on all that works my hands had brought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of the Spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Before God got in prayer, we'll sing 435. 435. Four loves of Dio Christ. For love to be Thank you. 
us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come and worship you. Help us to always show more love to Christ and the sacrifice that he gave us for the forgiveness of our sins. Please forgive us of our many sins. Help us to listen and participate in worship today in a way that pleases to you. Help us to gain something from the lesson that we can carry through our daily lives. Six oh two. Six hundred and two. Six zero two. Oh. 
of joy. God wants us to be joyful people. God expects us to be joyful people. Christians should be the most joyful people in the world. I don't believe that I would get an argument from anyone as far as that is true. But I want to read some famous quotes from the Bible now for our consideration. <coughs> Genesis 47 and verse 9. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been. Job 7. I love it. Well, let's start at verse 15. So that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my life. I love it. I would not live all way. Let me alone for my days are vanity. Psalms 51, verse 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Romans 7, 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? These people who said these, First, Jacob, we recognize that. The second one, Job. The third one, David. And then the last one was Paul. All men of great faith. All men who were striving to live righteous lives before God. And look at the things that they had to say about their lives and how they felt at this particular time. Does that sound like people who are full of joy? It doesn't sound like it. But I would submit unto you that they were people of joy. They had joy in their lives. They were. Consider what it says about Christ in Isaiah 53, verse 3. Despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Even our Lord Jesus Christ is going through life, had many things were happening in his life. Was joy, was joy a part of Jesus Christ's life? Of course it was. Jesus did not fail to live completely as God would have him to live in this life. He did not sin. He did not have any feelings or actions that were taken in his life that were opposite of what God would have him to be in life. He was a man of joy when he was here. But as we look at these things and we see that God expects it of us, we also look at our lives and see that many times... We're in a battle to be joyful people and to do what God expects us to do as far as our happiness is concerned. God does not want us to be unhappy people. Many people look at God and think that that's what God wants us to be and do, and that's why they don't want to be Christians, because they see Christianity as something that is down in the mouth, as something that is not fun, as something that is... Uh, not desired to have in this life. And you know, many people get that because they look at Christians. They look at me and they look at you and what do they see? Boy, they're the most happy people in the world. There's not a bit of joy in their lives. I don't want to have anything to do with that because it's no fun. What does joy mean to you and me? And the question that I ask myself, has I really got joy in my life? Is it a part of my life as a Christian? True joy doesn't come from operating outside the guise of the guidelines of God. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives us all things richly to enjoy. God has given us everything in this life to make our lives good and beneficial, to help us in life. But we have to do it within the guidelines of God. Hebrews 11, verse 24 and 25. We recognize that passage of Scripture because it relates to a man of faith, Moses. It says there, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We cannot be the joyful people that we need to be. We cannot have 
true joy if we're operating outside the guidelines of God's Word. Moses looked at his life and recognized the fact that he had two choices. He could step out of what God wanted and have what the world defined as a good life, a fun life, a life filled with a lot of things that he could enjoy. But he realized that there was a choice to be made there. That there was a difference between what true joy is and what the pleasures of this world are. The world does not understand and recognize that. We as Christians have to come to understand that there is a difference between the temporary happiness of this world and true joy. The distractions of this world keep us from being truly joyous people. It doesn't have to be sin, but it can be the things of this world that prevent us from having true joy in our life. That's what Jesus said. Luke 8, verse 14. And that which fell among the thorns are they, which when they have heard, go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. What are you saying, Lord? Saying that if you let those things in this life, the pleasures of this life, encompass your heart, your mind, and your life, you're not going to be able to be perfect. You're not going to be able to arise to that point of having the joy that is so desired by God and that we desire in our lives. It's crowded over. It's covered down. It's held back. But yet we and the world strive to get these things that we think are what will make us happy and give us joy. Not realizing that that is what is preventing us from having true joy. We have, in this world, many people who think they are living the life because of their happiness and the things that are providing these temporary forms of happiness, the pleasures that are going on in their life. But this is what the Bible says about how the life can be an illusion for people. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. We can have the things of life and we can think we're having a good life and we can think that we're happy. But realistically, when you look at it, what is true joy and happiness, it's not there. And realistically, we have no life at all. What are we pursuing in life? Do we have true joy? Or are we just seeking after pleasure like the world? Joy comes as a result of knowing God and God's expectations for us and then fulfilling them. Jesus knew what God's expectations were for him. John 12, verse 27 says, Now is my soul troubled. This is Jesus. Now is my soul troubled. That's not a word that is connected to joy. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this hour came I unto this hour. Or for this call, this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came a voice from heaven saying, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And the people therefore that stood by and heard it said, It is, it is thunder. Others said, An angel spake unto him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Jesus was not excited about the situation. He was not smiling and happy about what he was going through. As a matter of fact, he was in deep trouble, in a deeply troubled heart of what he was facing. He was right just a few days before being hung on the cross. But he knew what God's will for him. For this hour is why I came into the world. John 15 and 10 says this. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. What was Christ's joy? that he wanted us to have in our lives. 
You go back to John 12. His joy was doing the will of his Father. That's what he did the whole time he was here. That's what gave him that inner comfort and confidence in his life in facing the worst, the most horrific thing that he had to face the whole time he was here, the cross. He wants you and I to have that kind of joy. He wanted that for his disciples. And that's what we are asking ourselves today. Is that the kind of joy that we have, the joy of Christ? John 17 and 4 says, I have glorified thee on the earth, Christ speaking. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Jesus said this even before he was hung on the cross. I have finished the work. Jesus knew what he had to do. He knew why he was here. He knew what God expected of him. And he had fulfilled it up to that point. And there was nothing standing between him and fulfilling it all the way through the death of the cross. Therefore, he could say, I have finished the work. He knew that he was going to take every step of every problem that he faced getting to the cross and the cross itself. And he could have joy in his life because he knew that he was going to fulfill his role. And what he had to do and what God's expectations were of him. John the Baptist teaches us a great example. We talked about this in class this morning. John 3 and verse 22. It says, and, these things, and after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he carried with them and baptized. John also was baptized in the end near Salem because there was much water there. And they came were baptized. For, the John, for John was not yet cast into prison. Verse number 25 says, And then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizer, and all men come to him. There was a conflict going on here. John was baptizing over here. Jesus was baptizing over here. You know, who's right? Listen to what John said about himself here. Verse number 27. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear be witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that is the bride is he that hath the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him. Rejoice greatly because the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. What was John's joy in life? He was not in a competition with Christ. He was not trying to get his way. He was not trying to get glory and honor for himself. His was in that of lifting Christ and honoring Christ. What brings us joy in our life? Our lives must be like John's. We must decrease. And he must increase. True joy comes from and revolves around completely Christ himself. We cannot have joy without Christ. From the very beginning, Luke 2, and verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone out right about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. True joy is about Jesus Christ. True joy began when Christ came on the scene. But it goes all the way through the life of Christ into the death of Christ. And now we have it in the form of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is great joy when it comes to the preaching of the gospel and obedience to the gospel. You look at the example of Acts. In Acts chapter 8 where it says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For on the main spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsy, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Do we have a great joy in our heart because of the gospel? 
because of the preaching of the gospel, because of the obedience to the gospel. Is that what makes us happy in our lives and makes us feel good? The same is true with the preaching of Paul in Acts chapter 13. In the conflicts that he ran into in the midst of those Jews there as he taught the gospel, at the end of that passage, Acts 13, 52, it says, And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Those people who were involved in the preaching of the gospel and saw the glory of the gospel and the obedience of the gospel were filled with joy. What produces joy in our lives? Is it the gospel? It's a joy that is not just earthly. It's not something that is temporary, that is shared among each other, but it's a joy that reaches all the way to heaven. Jesus thought about it in the parable in Luke chapter 15. When he said in verse 4, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after him which is, that which is lost until he finds it? And when he had found it, he lay up it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he come upon him, he called together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven. Over one sinner that repenteth more than over the ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. I read, or I've heard people say, you know, in a certain football team uh, wins the national championship or a certain team wins the World Series, you know, God was happy. God was excited about that. We know that's foolishness. We know that God is not. Uh, interested in the games that we play and how we go about to find our uh, happiness. God is interested in the souls of mankind. What makes God happy? What makes heaven rejoice is when people change their lives and become Christians, become children of God, be obedient to the Word. Jesus wanted to emphasize the fact that that's what was really important. Because he used a whole chapter of Luke 15, more than one account, teaching the importance of coming to God and the joy that it creates. If you look at Luke 15, verse 8, it says, Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek it diligently. And when she had found it, she called her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. Over one sinner that repented. We think about the big and the numbers have to be grand before we think that God is excited and heaven is happy and there's rejoicing. When one person obeys the gospel, when one person turns their life over to God, there is rejoicing in heaven. True joy. Joy that, tr joy that takes up all the universe. Everything that is involved. But yet we won't make happiness one small, minuscule thing that will one day decay or that will be lost that we will never hold on to. Real joy can only be had in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I have a hard time, or had a hard time putting that statement down. True joy can only come in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The denominational world uses that term so loosely. Everybody has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But I want to use the example of Zacchaeus in John chapter 19, thinking about what true joy is and having a relationship with Jesus Christ. John 19 and 1, it says, And Jesus entered, to, entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little in stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, Make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Zacchaeus 
He had a great desire. He had heard about Christ. He wanted to see who this Jesus was. He didn't have the ability to do it. But you know what? Jesus came by and saw him up there. He said, come on down. I want to go to your house today. It says that he received the glory. When was Zacchaeus the one who received that joy? Was it up in that tree looking to find Jesus? Was the possibility of being a part of that crowd on that occasion the source of his joy? What brought Zacchaeus joy was the fact that Jesus Christ desired to have a relationship with him, spend time with him, to get to know him, and have Zacchaeus come to know him and to have a relationship with him. That's what produced the joy in Zacchaeus' life. And the same is true for you and for me. The world looks at Jesus and they want to see Jesus. They want to have Jesus in their lives. But they don't want to have the relationship that is demanded of us in order to have the joy that comes from it. We want it at arm's length. We want it at a distance. We don't want to have that close, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what it takes we have, in order to have real joy, it is founded upon the degree to which genuine Christianity is in our lives. Real Christianity, the real relationship with Christ, the full discipleship, as Jesus describes it. Do we have it? Do we have the kind of relationship with Christ that produces joy in our hearts? I would hope so. But I find myself, and I imagine that I'm not exclusive in this, that I'm often battling with that idea of having joy in my life. Am I excited about my Christianity? Why do I feel so bad? Why am I struggling so much? Because I know I'm striving to live what's right, but yet still, deep in my heart, it just doesn't seem to be there. What can I do? How can I get there? I think there are four things that I want to submit to you that I believe will help me, help you, in building true joy in our lives. The first thing that I think we need to do if we're going to have true joy in our lives is we have to build that relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not a one-time thing on Sunday morning. It's not a three-time thing on Sunday, Sunday night and Wednesday night. A relationship is seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We want a relationship with Jesus Christ without nurturing it, without renewing it, without developing it. How much time do we spend with Christ in our relationship to Him? Is it just a brief passing on Sunday morning? We will never have great degree of genuine Christianity that's all there is. So many people are not willing to make the commitment to Jesus Christ. And that's number two. We have to make a commitment to the relationship. So many people have just enough religion so that they can't be happy with the world. Their deal needs some love. They go on and do it and think that they're happy. So many people have so much world in their religion that their Christianity seems empty, vain, no use. We have to make a commitment to Christ in order for us to have a relationship to Christ. I heard a great sermon Friday night down at Creed Hall. The preacher preached on Luke chapter 14. Verses 25 through 35. I'm not going to go through it now. He had a six-point sermon about that particular passage of Scripture. But I would encourage you, if you want to increase your joy in your Christianity, to look at what kind of commitment Christ expects of you and I. Spend time this week looking at Luke 14, 25 through 35. If you want to be a joyful Christian, Jesus teaches us how to accomplish it. We'll just read it, follow it, and apply it. Third thing that I think will increase our joy, I better smile, I'm looking like I'm getting a little unhappy here. 
is we had to change our attitude about the problems of our lives, the conflicts that we face, and specifically about conflicts that come upon us because of Christianity. James said in James 1, 2, and 3, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. What is our attitude towards those things that confront us because we're trying to live right? Are we down in the mouth? Do we run from them? Do we think it's a bad situation? James tells us that we're supposed to be joyful about it. We have to have an attitude that it is benefiting us and that there is a benefit to be had from it. Peter said even more in 1 Peter 1 and verse 6. He says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. We have a sense of rejoicing in the fact that we are Christians and we have the hope of heaven, the forgiveness of our sins. But he says, if need be, ye are in heaviness, though, through manifold temptations. There is a sense of joy within you, but also there is a sense of despair or heartache within you as well. We carry both of them in our lives at all times. There are things that affect us negatively. There are things that affect us positively. What are we going to focus on? The negative or the positive? Paul says this, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold, that perisheth though you be tried the fire, not be found in the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. How do we change that focus? We look at the problem and say, this is making me what God wants me to be. This is making me stronger, better equipped, ready for heaven. It's not a downer. It's a positive. Jesus taught it explicitly. And they based these teachings on the Holy Spirit and on what Christ said in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Jesus looking at you and me in the life that we're living said we're to rejoice. When people are just down on us, are mistreating us, are persecuting us because of our Christianity. Most people don't want to do that. Most people want to do everything within their power to avoid that. That causes us not to have true joy in our lives. And then the final thing, the fourth point, is that we have to have a clear vision what's beyond the horizon. Jesus did, and that's what got him through the cross. Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. How was Jesus able to face the cross? How was Jesus able to bear up to the cross and have the joy in his life even going through all of that, he could see beyond the cross. He could see sitting on the right hand of the throne of God. He could see what the future held for him after all this was over. Can we look that far in the future? Can we see what is out before us and the glory and the grandeur that is ours to behold and to take part in and to have for our own? Most people can't, they can't get past today. What I'm going to eat, what I'm going to wear, what I've got to face today. We don't spend much time looking at the joy that is laid before us in heaven. The apostles, when Jesus died, were a solemn, sad group of people. But look what Luke said in Luke 24, verse 50 about them. And as he laid them out as far as the bed, and he lifted up his hands and blessed him. And it came to pass while they blessed him, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And were continued in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. What was the difference? What was the difference between their attitudes and their hearts and their feelings right after Jesus was crucified?
And now Jesus was again being taken away from them, and yet they had great joy in their hearts. It was the fact that they could see the future. And what was beyond Acts 111, Luke gives us a clear statement as to why they had such great joy. He says, while they were gazing up into heaven, it says, which also said, the angel appeared to them and said, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you in heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Why were they able to go back into Jerusalem rejoicing and excited? Because they knew Jesus Christ was coming back. They know, knew what the future held for them. Paul speaks often about our joy and rejoicing in the Lord. He said this in 2 Timothy 4 verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all men that love his appearing. That's why Paul could write from a Roman prison, Philippians 4 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. It wasn't the immediate circumstances that surrounded the life of Paul that gave him his joy. It was the fact that he was a faithful Christian. He had done what God expected of him, and that he expected to receive a crown in the short future. Is that what our joy is based upon? Is that why we're such excited people and people can see our Christianity in us? If not, then we need to make a change. Joy is a byproduct. It is divinely given to those who are one with the Lord. What is your relationship with Christ today? Are you one with Him? Does your relationship with Him mean more than anything in this world and provide for you the joy that gets you through each day, each week, each month? Each year, through each prophet. If not, then I want to suggest, suggest to you that you need to build your relationship with Jesus Christ. I can guarantee you that you do. If you make that commitment to nurture, to develop, to live up to it, develop the right kind of attitude, there will be a deep seated joy in your life that nothing that ever happens in your life can take it away from you. But if we want to walk, Halfway committed. And I'm here to tell you that we will never be truly joyous people. We will constantly be in battle with ourselves, disappointed with ourselves, because we know what the truth is and we know what we have to do. If you're not a child of God, you can start by receiving the joy that comes from becoming a Christian, knowing that you've been forgiven of all your sins, that you are in a relationship with Christ, with God have the promise of the hope of heaven. And the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit to help you through this life. It started by being obedient. Becoming a child of God from hearing the word, believing in Christ as the Son of God. Turning from your sin and repentance, confessing as the Son of God and being baptized. That is the first step to true joy. And I know that all of us have Bibles in our lives. Even Jesus was faced with temptation. We are all tempted to go the way of the world, to seek the pleasures of this world because we've been deceived by the devil to think that that's what life is all about. But it's not. It's not what life is all about. Life is about finding that true joy that's in Christ, the relationship with God, and then living it to the best of our ability. When we fail, making it right by confessing the sins, repenting of it, praying God for forgiveness. That provides for us the joy in our lives, knowing that we know what God has told us to do in doing it. Because you have the joy in your life, the real joy in your life. If you don't, now is a great opportunity to start to develop that joy by knowing that you're faithful to God. You need to respond to the Lord's invitation to come and be in a relationship with I hope you will. I'll be at least hands while we sing.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come presenting your son's death on the cross. Help us to focus our minds, to understand why this was done and this true sacrifice that was made. Help us to partake of this bread and drink of this body that was broken on the cross. And a matter of pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. 
Lord, this is for all our 